So uh, this is a kind of a brief introduction to hydroponics. Hydroponics is the cultivation of plants in a liquid nutrient solution rather in soil or even a soil-less growing system. It's growing in a liquid nutrient system. Hydroponics comes from the word hydros for water and ponics, panos for labor. Now, you can go back into the history and there's some debate on whether or not all of this was considered hydroponics or not, but when you, can, you can find um, water gardening practices, the hanging gardens of Babylon were all water gardens. Uh, even to the Colombian Abstecs of Mexico, they were farming in water. Now, neither one of them were actually using a nutrient culture, so it's not typically, not really by the hard definition hydroponics, but they were doing a water culture. So, we're looking with a mineral nutrition system. Um, growing plants, you know, growing aquatic plants is not hydroponics, it's growing aquatic plants. And uh, actually, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon was more like what we're looking at in rooftop gardens. And there's going to be a course, I believe the course is going to be taught this fall in rooftop gardens and rooftop farming by Dr. Jennifer Busselow who's currently teaching uh, Hort 454. So if that's something that you're interested in, there'll be an experimental course coming soon in rooftop gardening. She did her PhD work in rooftop gardens and her experimental plots were at the EPA building in downtown Denver. So hydroponics really was first uh, put together by a British physician um, named John Woodward, and that's the first documented efforts of really true scientific hydroponics. And it wasn't until the 1800s that we started using uh, more nutrient solutions. The word hydroponics really wasn't um, used too much until we had uh, William Frederick Garricky from UC Berkeley. Now, Garricky was one of those academics that tr decided that he was going to keep all of his secrets to himself and never published any of this information. Therefore, he lost tenure over the word hydroponics because he kept things too private. Um, but um, event, so Garricky was actually the founder of the word hydroponics. And he defined it as a growth in a mineral nutrition, nutrient solution, no solid media, and so we had water, nutrients, and roots. Um, you'll hear the word hydroponics referred to sand culture, organic rock wool culture, uh, just anything like that, and it's not truly hydroponics. Hydroponics, by the true definition, is only water and nutrients. Okay. You're going to hear hydroponics used in a lot of different ways. Now, there's a, two researchers from UC Berkeley, uh, Hoagland and Arnon, and today we always talk about Hoagland's solution. Most of our nutrient solutions are based upon Hoagland and Arnon's research from the late 1930s. So whenever you look at a research article on growing plants and nutrient culture, you'll say we're using a Hoagland solution. Well, it was created by these two guys in 1938. So the advances in hydroponic system, um, anybody been to Epcot in Orlando? Okay. Um, they've had a uh, hydroponic or a uh, greenhouse type of a system on display since the uh, early 1980s, ever since, eight, et, ever since Epcot was built in the Land Pavilion. Uh, the Land Pavilion offers, if anybody's looking for a really cool internship, the Land Pavilion provides six month internships working there, okay? Um, we currently have an intern there, uh, Thomas, actually he's there on a, a post-graduation internship, but um, I've had 15 students working there over, the, over my career, and Les Fry, the internship coordinator, is a CSU graduate, so you guys have an inside edge. Okay. All right. So they're demonstrating a lot of different hydroponic techniques, even aeroponics and, uh, and different kinds of culture. Uh, their uh, hydroponics is also being researched by NASA. Um, this work is being done at um, Cape Canaveral, uh, they're actually, their hydroponic system is inside a bear, uh, an old uh, Kennedy, era, uh, Mercury era, era hypobaric chamber. 
So they're looking at controlled in ecological life support system where they're doing soil as culture. Uh, and that work, is, like I said, is being done in Cape Canaveral. Uh, and, and also uh, there's some mirrored work in hydroponics research at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Uh, the folks at Tucson are also working with hydroponic uh, production down at uh, the South Pole Research Station. Um, so hydroponics has been ar around for a while. Um, hydroponics uh, was probably first really <coughs> developed for hydroponic vegetable production by um, Pan American Airlines. And during the early days of, of overseas um, uh, flight, uh, planes had to stop and refuel and gather food and produce. And there was a major hydroponic operation in Wake Island of the Pacific Ocean uh, where they grew vegetables. There's no soil there, it's just a volcanic rock in the middle of the uh, middle of the Pacific Ocean. And they were using that to grow vegetables for their international transport. And in fact, um, one of the islands that was that they flew over when they show pictures of Raiders of the Lost Ark when their Indiana Jones is flying over actually included Wake Island. <laughs> I have lots of silly facts. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. You bring in Indiana Jones into a greenhouse crop. There are two basic kinds of hydroponic production that we'll talk about in the industry. There's the solution culture, which is the true hydroponics. And there's hydroponic, which is a medium or some kind of a structural base. The lettuce that's up here in the top right-hand corner, this is a trough, little rain gutter type uh, arrangement. And uh, nutrients are, flo are fl uh, flooded down the trough. And that's called NFT, or nutrient film technique, or trough culture. This is true hydroponics because there's no soil. Down here in the left lower left hand picture. This is medium culture and actually these are tomatoes that are being grown on a ro uh, either a rock wool or a core slab and but this is still called hydroponics by the industry. I see people looking like they're getting cold. See if that warms up. And the air conditioning on. You know that they're going to finalize the air conditioning in Shepherdson this spring, starting the week after spring break. And all the faculty have to vacate their offices for a week. Do you know what to do about storage yet for your epic office? I have no idea what I'm going to do. <laughs> there are others that have more of a panic than I. <laughs> yes? So what's keeping that lettuce from Falling into the What's keeping the lettuce from falling into the container? Okay, what they'll do, there's a little, there's a little plastic snap together lid, and it's got a small hole cut in it, and they'll start the lettuce in a rock wool cube. And then the roots just kind of dangle in there, so it's held together. If you're to go to the grocery store and buy uh, locally grown bib lettuce, okay, it's probably coming from Circle Fresh Farms, and they're one of the local hydroponics growers in the state. Probably next year we'll get to tour their facility, but um, they're actually selling, they're, they're going to be selling, one of the freshest way to sell hydroponic lettuce, to sell it with the roots, because it stays the freshest in the clamshell. But what's holding it in there, it right now, it started out as a little small foam cube that's wedged in the hole, and eventually it just supports itself. So it does have a little bit of it started out with a little bit of foam, yeah. So solution culture doesn't use a solid medium for the roots, just the nutrient solution. So you have to provide some kind of support. Remember the four things you had to have support, water, nutrients, and air. Um, three types of main types of solution color culture are static culture, continuous flow, or aeroponics. So in a static system where the nutrient solution is um, not recirculated, we have to provide air. So they'll put air stones or tubes with bubblers or something like that. The nutrient film system, 
is where we're pumping out of a reservoir into a trough and recirculating the system. Aeroponics is we're actually spraying the roots with the nutrient system and hanging in the air. And an ebb and flood system, ebb and flood, we'll talk about ebb and flood irrigation in the next section, where we flood the, the, the root zone and then we drop it out. So we're giving it episodic pulses of water and then an episodic pulse, then letting it dry out, have the air. Static culture, plants are grown in solution, buckets and tubs, um, typically have to aerate it. A lot of times, uh, this is um, what's called raft culture. Uh, raft culture is where you have a big uh, vat of nutrient solution and you just float some styrofoam, a sheet of styrofoam insulation or something like that with holes cut in it, put the plants in there, and you're just floating on the raft. And that's why most lettuce is done. This is the NFT system. You're asking about how that lettuce is held in there. Uh, the NFT, you can see the little uh, cubes that holds the, the starter plant in and eventually the roots uh, grow into the nutrient film solution. Uh, the NFT, where you just, uh, it's constantly recirculating across bare roots. The aeroponics, um, where you're spraying and misting the roots. I've stole all kinds of pictures for this one. This is an aeroponic system that's at uh, Epcot, where uh, they're growing spinach on the on a, on a side of a board, and they've got misters inside and a, vault, and a tank underneath. Uh, this, I like this particular system because uh, it doesn't take up a whole lot of space. Uh, most um, tomato hydroponic production is in either rock wool or core slabs or uh, gravel culture. Um, you can see that we're supporting a pretty significantly tall crop in here. Um, the slab culture where we, uh, we actually start the seedlings in these cubes and then we put the cube on the slab and it's all pinned together with a, a basket stake with the irrigation emitter. Question. Um, so for a rock wool system like that, will that recapture the water and recirculate it or will that just drain the waste? Okay. Will, that re will this system recapture the water that's recirculated? Uh, you can do it both ways. Most growers try to capture the water and recirculate it. And when we talk about water and irrigation, we'll talk about recirculated water. There are some challenges with recirculated water. Um, one, you have to think about your nutrient balance to maintain a good nutrient balance all the time. Are you freezing back there? It, what, what can you think would be some challenges with a um, capturing that water? Nutrient balance is one. Salt what about? Salt accumulation. Salt accumulation. Yeah, could be. Disease. You're going back to a central reservoir, I'm assuming, that you irrigate the whole greenhouse, right? One set of plants gets a disease, you just spread it to the rest of the greenhouse. So one of the challenges is disinfecting and cleaning up that water. Now if you're, <clears throat> water is pretty cheap. Fertilizer is pretty cheap in reality, okay, compared to fuel and labor and other things. What, so a lot of growers just pump it out. I've heard stories of some operations discharging 30,000 gallons of water a day. Now that water is full of nitrate. Now you're doing bioremediation, like you have over the greenhouse here. Exactly, you have to have some kind of bioremediation. Recycling is the way, though. So here's a, a picture of a pile of rock wool that's being put into slabs. Uh, most people buy their slabs ready-made, though. 
And hydroponic crops include peppers, tomatoes, lettuce, cucumbers, Gerber daisies, cut flowers. Uh, the equipment that's required for hydroponic production, you have to have some kind of a nutrient solute. These are uh, nutrient vats that are pumped into a greenhouse system. These nutrient vats support a 40 acre greenhouse. Um, you have to have, of course, this, like I said, this is a 40 acre greenhouse, so the, the technology is fairly, fairly sophisticated with filters, and this particular operation does capture and recycle their, operate, their, their water distribution pumps, um, fertilizer mixing, water storage. Um, a lot of um, greenhouses don't have the capacity to, to water straight out of a well. They'll, they'll pump all the time and store the water on site. This particular operation also captures and stores, recycles their water. Uh, filtration, if you're recapturing or bringing it back, you have to filter the water. Um, this is a, um, a system that's used to uh, UV sterilization, it uses UVC radiation to sterilize that re recycled water to make sure all the microorganisms have been killed. Uh, another thing about hydroponic vegetable production, uh, especially crops like tomatoes and cucumbers, they have to be pollinated by an insect. You can hand pollinate it yourself, but insects like the bumblebees do a much, they're much more efficient and the labor is much cheaper. They don't uh, have workman's compensation claims. Um, we use impatiens bombus, uh, bombus impatiens, excuse me, is the species of bumblebee we use. We do not use honeybees in greenhouses for tomato production for a couple reasons. Number one, honeybees are more uh, gregarious and more uh, territorial than bumblebees. They're more aggressive, and they forage much more widely than a bumblebee. Uh, honeybees forage a mile, two to three miles, where bumblebees are lazy and they'll stay right where the food source is. So each of these bumblebee hives, is, each box is a hive, it's a commercially produced hive. It's got its own queen, it's got its own drones, it's got its own food source, um, they have a, a uh, an artificial nectar that they manufacture, they put in there, and uh, the growers call it bee happy. Uh, also, the growers will go periodically go out and collect pollen and give the bees a little bit of a treat. Question? Have you heard of any like greenhouses or operations that do kind of like joint vegetable crops and like honey production? Or is that joint greenhouse crops where they do um, honey production and vegetable production? No, because Honeybees just do not stay in the greenhouse. Uh, honeybees are much more gregarious. They forage much more wide. And there's not enough food for honeybees in a greenhouse. They, they just, not enough food. Because um, we have to supplement their diet, even in these boxes, um, the, with the, um, the bumblebees. And the thing about bumblebees is um, people can go in there and work fairly closely without risk of being stung. I mean, I've been going in and out of greenhouse tomato operations for most of my career. I've been stung three times. Now, I know that I'm not a worker and probably not all the time. If you have bees, you also have to maintain um, some kind of medical records of your employees in case they're allergic to bee stings. You have to maintain epinephrine and all that kind of stuff for reactive sh anaphylactic shock. Yes? Do you know if bumblebees produce honey? Bumblebees do not produce honey. No. They so a uh, hive is bought, you buy the hive commercially, uh, it comes in with its own queen, and these hives are set up with doorways that, um, so if you want to trap your bees inside, like if you want to do a pesticide application or something like that, um, you can set the door so they can go in but can't come out, or they can't come out at all. Um, most greenhouses that use um, bumblebees for pollination use virtually no pesticides because bumblebees are very sensitive to pesticides. Um, so if you're buying a greenhouse vegetable 
at the grocery store, it's more than likely it was grown pesticide free. So I will buy a greenhouse vegetable grown in a greenhouse, a greenhouse grown vegetable before I grow up buy an organic vegetable because I know that they're pesticide free. Um, tomatoes um, are harvested based upon the distance to market. In other words, if we're growing in Colorado and we're shipping to New York, we're going to harvest at a different, uh, different um, ripeness than we're going to harvest if we're shipping it to Denver. So most everything is harvested at least what's called a breaker stage, first blush. Um, the, to make, the tomato that's on the far left has not hit the breaker stage. If this green tomato is harvested, it will never pass that level of ripeness. You have to wait till it starts to ripen the middle to where it gets the breaker stage. Now, for instance, the one in the middle might be shipped a thousand miles, where the one on the far right may only be shipped fifty miles. Are they all treated with ethylene? Are they all treated with ethylene? Uh, tomatoes are not typically treated with ethylene. Um, Ethylene gas is the ripening gas. Um, tomatoes are not. Uh, tomatoes are in the in the pack house or in the produce warehouses are stored with the ethylene equipment because that temperature is at 50 degrees. Uh, tomatoes should not be stored lower than 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Tomatoes do not belong in your refrigerator. Okay. Here's a fun way to wow and impress your friends. Go get a really ripe tomato. Store it for about four weeks in the refrigerator. Do you know what's going to happen? After about four weeks, the hormones in the tomato will go away under those temperature conditions. Then the hormones that block seed germination. And the seed will start to germinate inside the fruit. You cut it open, it looks like all the seeds are starting to germinate, it looks like little worms. But it's just seed, it's just the, it's just the radical. It tastes pretty bitter and nasty, but it really weirds out your friends. <laughs> so here's an opportunity to be a really hort geek. <laughs> it's called vivipary. Vivipary. So, it's fun. Like I said, wow and weird your friends, so. Uh, final product, um, you know, uh, most of the, the vine ripened tomatoes are pretty popular. Uh, personally, my favorite uh, in flavor. Um, you can also get different kinds of packs. There are a lot of people growing flowers in hydroponics. Um, I thought I would show a couple of slides of some uh, commercially uh, designed hydroponic systems that you could buy at uh, the hobby stores or buy online or something like that. But frankly, most everything I'm going to show you, you can build with materials yourself at Home Depot. Um, so here's some lettuce growing in some hydroponic systems. I got my slides mixed up. So this is one commercially prepared hydroponic system. Um, the nutrient storage tanks are in these khaki light tan buckets. And it's just recirculated through a series of pumps. I can't remember the brand name of this one. But all of them grow strong, healthy roots. All of them, I went, looked at all, several different ones at the Garden Home Show. Everybody grows one that's better than the others. Um, can you do anything with the roots of any plant species? Can you do anything with the roots of any plant species? I mean, you've got a ton of roots there, and they're very yeah. easily harvestable, whereas in soil, you wouldn't really be able to do anything with them. I can't think of any crop that I'd want to eat that. Um, it's got that nutrient solution going through it all the time. Or could you just reuse it for and amend other soil with it? Would that help? You can compost it, yes. You can certainly compost that. 
A lot of growers will compost it. One of the issues with um, the, these systems that get really tall, uh, especially if it's 20 or 30 feet, you've got all the plastic clips, is getting the string and the cords and stuff out of that for the composting process, and getting rid of the junk. And um, some companies would rather pay a tipping fee and send it to the landfill and spend the labor to get the clips and stuff out. Um, but it's all compostable, yes, yeah, all. I mean, it's all compostable. This is basil. Uh, basil is one of my favorite crops to grow in hydroponics. Um, it grows very well in hydroponics. Um, okay, here's a picture of one of these. We have the nutrient reservoir in the bottom, and it's got a little air pump, and it circulates it through this, these uh, ceramic pebbles. You can stack them, you can do just about it. When it comes to hydroponic systems, the limitation is your own imagination. Of course, these are all patented systems. Uh, this is an aeroflow system. Um, this is a traditional greenhouse tomato operation. On, on uh, this is a, as you can see by this student worker's reach, how tall the plants are. Uh, a lot of operations will use uh, lifts and, and ladders to get the employees up. And this worker is actually uh, working as a, a, a cord to support the plants. Uh, Rockwell culture, that's the core. Coconut fiber, bumblebees again. There's two companies, two major companies in the world that supply bumblebees and uh, supply um, predatory insects for biological control. One is Copert, uh, K-O-P-P-E-R-T, and the other one is BioBest. Those are the two primary companies in the world that supply these products. Um, tomatoes ready to harvest. Here's a grading line. Uh, all this is, a lot of this is graded by hand and packed. Uh, strawberries grow very well in hydroponics, uh, greenhouse production. Um, however, strawberries, um, like tomatoes, have to have uh, some kind of pollination. If the strawberry is not pollinated evenly, it'll provide misshapen fruit. And if you want to know more about strawberries, who do you ask? Dr. Hughes. Dr. Hughes, yes. Uh, <clears throat> just lost my question. I, you're, oh, with the bees. Uh, I mean, I've heard a bunch about having problems with bees disappearing and whatnot. Do you ever run into that problem with green? Bees bees disappearing? Yeah, due to pesticide use or viruses, okay. whatever. Um, you're referring to um, bee calling to decline. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Commercially uh, sold bumblebee hives are not as subject to colony decline as the honeybees are. Um, there's a lot of theories going on about colony decline, and there are certainly people on, in our college that know much more about that than I do, and that would be Matt Camper and Whitney Crenshaw. Okay, so colony decline. Colony decline is related to a lot of different things. Number one, imatocloprid or neonicotinoid pesticides is extremely devastating to any bees, including bumblebees. Neonicotinoid pesticides. Um, unfortunately, neonicotinoid pesticides are extremely mammalian safe, but extremely deadly to most insect life, which is why we use them. Uh, Dr. Cranshaw and I did a, a research project, oh, 15 years ago, when Marathon, one of the first imatoclopid products came out, we put it in a greenhouse full of bumblebees and the bumblebee colonies, and all we did was put it in the soil and it translocated up through the system and got into the pollen and the colonies were dead in two weeks. So, neonicotinoid pesticide, now of course if you were to Google 
uh, neonicotinoid, pesticide, honeybee, and tilia cordata. You'll find an in incident last spring where a company went into a um, parking lot, treated some trees with uh, a, a neonicotinoid pesticide during full bloom of these tilia plants. And I don't know if you ever smelled little leaf, little leaf, little leaf linden bloom. It's very pungent, very sweet, very fragrant. And of course, they attract bees. Within days, there were just dead bees everywhere. Okay, that's one thing. And that's the fault. The fault there is misappropriation of a pesticide at the wrong time. You don't apply a pesticide during full bloom because you're going to kill bees. You know, neonicotinoid pesticides are good tools when they're used correctly. That's one aspect of colony decline. There's the Charon mite. There's some. There's some mites. There's some viruses. There's all different kinds of things that are impacting bees. Um, the more people that, ha uh, more backyard bee producers we have, uh, the better, because we have more more bees in our environment. I've got a very close friend, yours too, Mark Coleman. He's a beekeeper. Uh, his backyard, a friend of ours. Um, I live about a mile and a half from them, and we've actually marked their, we're, their bees come into my yard. So, uh, Rhonda Kosky, who works at uh, Perk, she's a beekeeper. Uh, the, Northern the Northern Colorado Beekeepers Association, very active. So if you're interested in bees, uh, you want to know more of the facts, you really should talk to Dr. Cranshaw and Matt Camper. Yeah. Whose bees were at um, Ag Adventure? Whose bees were at Ag Adventure? I'm going to take a wild guess that they were Rhonda Koski's. And that's just a wild but probably safe guess. They may have people out there doing their own bees anyway. We've had bees at Perk. I have discouraged it because, um, and the main reason I've discouraged it is for uh, public safety, too many people, I don't know everybody's a tolerance to bee stings and I'm a little bit of a paranoid guy when it comes to the health and safety of my students. So. So. Um, even Hobby Greenhouse, this is a product called the Aero Garden, um, sold by a company in Boulder. Um, little tabletop thing. It really works sold on late night TV along with uh, Chia Pets. <laughs>